It would go down in history as the largest armed labor conflict in American history, but it would begin with what appeared to be a normal strike. In 1920, the coal fields of West Virginia were producing a quarter of the nation's bituminous coal. Those employed were of a colorful variety, white Appalachian locals, black Americans moving north to avoid Jim Crow, and especially European immigrants who spoke little to no English. In a high-risk market where the bottom dollar fluctuated rapidly, the operators of coal companies cut costs at any turn. Companies aimed to keep their workers paid by the ton, but that was the tip of the iceberg. The workers in the coal industry owed the company payment for rent, payment for tools, payment for usage of the facilities. There was hardly a thing not deducted from a mine worker's paycheck. Such little pay to work in such dangerous conditions led to workers to begin unionizing. Early attempts to unionize in America in the late 19th century met mixed results, but the creation of the United Mine Workers of America began to yield some success in the coal fields of the Midwest, as well as industrial titan states like Pennsylvania. Spurred on by these successes, the UMWA hoped to be able to negotiate union contracts that promised better pay and better working conditions to the workers of southern West Virginia. It was not uncommon for coal companies to respond to these talks by firing any worker believed to be with the union and to place armed guards to keep them out of company property. The old gentlemanly format of negotiating was going nowhere in southern West Virginia, causing a change of philosophy amongst the unionists. When coal operators refused a two and a half cent wage increase, miners at Peyton Cabin Creek went on strike in the summer of 1912. The union was apprehensive to join. No negotiating was next to impossible. Newer leaders emerged, such as Frank Keeney and Fred Mooney, endorsed by the most famous labor speaker at the time, Mother Jones. Keeney, who had been a miner for much of his adult life, trying to make a living for his parents, his children, his wife, and her parents, off of a miner's meager wage, exchanged the tired method of political action for the use of what he called direct action. When the Peyton Cabin Creek operators brought in hired guns, strikers met them with their own patrols. Gunfire crackled sporadically for nearly a year as the strike dragged on. Striking miners opened fire on trains carrying out-of-state non-union miners called scabs into the region to try and reopen the mines. Guards armored up a train and rushed it into a tent colony, opening fire on tents holding women and children. It got so bad that the governor of West Virginia was forced to call upon the National Guard to enter and disarm both parties. The Union gained little in this first Cold War in terms of contracts, but it did help affirm changing tides and tactics and beliefs of both unions and companies. Frank Keeney was elected president of District 17 of the UMWA, being joined in office by Fred Mooney as the new secretary treasurer. Together they set out to do what was, was thought of to be impossible, unionize Southern West Virginia. Their plans were interrupted by the First World War. Coal spiked in demand to turn America's war machine. Many a miner traded their pickaxe in for a rifle overseas. To keep things running smoothly, the government for the first time began to intervene and give workers more benefits to ensure the workforce stayed. Union leaders hoped that by the war's end, they would have ground to negotiate their demands. They were in for a rude awakening. With the war over, the price of coal plummeted to a low as it ever had been. 1918 was marked by a so-called Spanish flu pandemic. 1919 was marked by a series of awful racial riots in cities, with politicians pinning the violence on the rise of socialism. In central West Virginia, District 17's attempt at a strike was put down with threats of violent strike breaking. The union's hope for approval was out of the realm of possibility, and companies began doubling down on their wage cuts and price gouging to make as much bank as they could in the economic slum they found themselves in. Things were especially hard in early 1920 in the southern coal fields. A wave of influenza broke out in the Williamson coal field at a time when companies were raising the fees for medical aid. When these miners along the Tug River got word that the U.S. Coal Commission suggested union miners should receive a 27% increase in their wages, they too wanted some sort of competing raise. Mooney and Keeney sensed there was a chance to at last gain ground for District 17. Mooney himself rode to Williamson, rallying miners to pledge to the UMWA. Two to three hundred men listened to his speech. 
nearly all were willing to join. The strike for unionization in southern West Virginia was on. In order to facilitate the strike, the union would need an office in the vicinity of the strike. That would require a community not owned by a coal company, to which there were very few. But 15 miles to the southeast of Williamson lay one such town, the community of Matewan. Although it was entirely surrounded by land owned by the Stone Mountain Coal Company, the business and streets that approximately 800 people inhabited were independent. Its mayor was Cabell Testerman, a popular merchant of the community, who left the town's law in the hands of Albert Sidney Hatfield, known around town simply as Sid. Hatfield had been a miner once, but had moved to jobs above ground as soon as he could. His notoriety for being a gunslinger, as well as his popularity amongst Matewan's residents, landed him the position of police chief. When Mooney asked about having a union office in town, Testerman and Hatfield promised protection. On his view of minors unionizing, Hatfield was quoted as saying, If there was a law against minors organizing, I wouldn't let them. But since it is their right to organize, I'll see to it that their rights are respected and none of them are molested by hired gunmen in the employ of coke operators. By May of 1920, over 3,000 workers in Mingo County were on strike. They were encamped and cobbled together tent colonies on the outskirts of company property. They attended regular rallies in and around Matewan to hear speeches that keep up their morale. Then came the hired gunmen. On May 19, 1920, 13 men in black suits disembarked off a train from Bluefield. These were Baldwin Felt detectives, one of the most popular agencies hired by coal companies to enforce their will. They had gained infamy for their involvement in the 1914 Ludlow Massacre, where women and children were killed. Now they had come to Matewan on the same day that hundreds of strikers had gathered to receive rations and supplies being distributed by the Union. The agents were led by Albert and Lee Feltz, brothers of the agency's co-leader, Thomas Feltz. They had come at the employment of the Stone Mountain Coal Company to evict striking families who remained in their company-owned homes. They also came with a proposition. The Feltz brothers offered to pay testermen to allow them to place a machine gun's nest on the roof of buildings overlooking Main Street. Testerman flatly refused and claimed the families the agents had come to evict lay on town property. The Feltz agents manned a car and took the short ride to the homes they'd come to evict. Meanwhile, Sid Hatfield phoned County Sheriff G.T. Blankenship, wanting warrants for the arrest of the agents, which Blankenship promised would be on the next train bound for Matewan. The phone operators claimed Hatfield used some harsh language to state that the agents were never going to leave town alive. Hatfield and Testerman rode to the scene of the evictions and demanded to see the documents legalizing their actions. Albert Feltz had none. The agent then threatened Hatfield at gunpoint, claiming he was trespassing on Stone Mountain coal property. Hatfield had no choice but listen to Feltz tell him off, return to town, and await the warrants. By the time the agents returned to town, they'd evicted six families. A crowd of armed miners had begun to gather. The agents ate an early dinner at the Uraeus Hotel, then packed up their rifles and machine guns and began to make way to the depot. Hatfield and Testerman confronted Albert and Lee again in the doorway of Chambers Hardware Store. Both Hatfield and Albert Feltz fret threatened the other with warrants for their arrest. Testerman examined Feltz's warrant, calling it bogus. Several shots then rang out at once. Testerman and Feltz both fell instantly. From inside the hardware store, deputies stepped out and opened fire. Only four of the agents had permits to carry, and half of them had been cut down by this time. Some tried running across the tracks to the station, being shot down from second floor windows. Bullets broke apart the glass of the nearby bank, lodging into the brick facade of the row of buildings along Main Street. As the surviving agents scattered, the shooting became sporadic. When the smoke cleared, ten men were dead. Among them were both Feltz brothers. Testerman would die of his wounds before reaching the hospital in Williamson. Two unarmed miners were also slain in the crossfire. Hatfield emerged unscathed, raising the suspicion of some over who was the first to pull the trigger and why. Regardless of motives, the Myers had shot it out with the company's hired guns and had gained a great victory for their cause.
The Maywan Massacre, as it became to be known, was the spark the Union needed to light Mingo County into full support. The UMWA shifted all of their resources into funding the strike as just about the entire county, as well as parts of neighboring McDowell County, joined in walking off the job. Union miners swarmed the streets of Maitwan on a daily basis as meetings were held in places like the newly opened restaurant of C.E. Lively, who had arrived in town shortly after the shootout to work in the mines, then get immediately fired and joined the strike. But the retaliation at Hatfield and Utter's fear did soon arrive as companies began employing Baldwin Felt and other hired guards by the hundreds. Hoping to bounce back from a financially poor summer, operators were determined to smuggle in scab miners. Strikers began shooting at the pit mounts, leading to gun battles with the hired guards up and down the Tug River. Seeing that local chiefs like Hatfield were accepting of the Union actions, operators pleaded with Governor Cornwell to send in state troopers. But the commander of the West Virginia police refused to intervene as guards for the company. Cornwell was forced to reactivate the National Guard and send them to Williamson and Matewan, escorting scab miners to work and keeping strikers from intervening with daily operations. The war raged in the courts as well, as new decisions in the Court of Appeals barred UMWA leaders from communicating with non-union workers. In some company jurisdictions, any form of union advertisement was legally outlawed by the courts and there was the looming investigation into the Maitwan Massacre. But as long as soldiers stood firm in the Tug River Valley, things were kept relatively calm. Cornwell believed the crisis was averted, recalling the National Guard on November 4th, and turning the region over to the few state troopers stationed under the command of Captain James Brokus. Three days later, the valley was rattled by the collapse of a tipple. Two men were wounded in a shootout near Wall, and strikers from tents had shot at non-union miners or Nolan. A gunfight sprung on a moving train. A trestle was dynamited, and state troopers were dead. By the end of November, Mingo County was back under martial law, under the control of 500 men of the 19th Infantry Regiment. Winter froze the conflict on the ground, while final preparations were made for the highly anticipated trial. On January 26, 1921, the trial of the Maitwan Massacre began at the Mingo County Courthouse in Williamson. Over 20 men, including Hatfield, were pinned with an assortment of charges, including murder. But proving that the deaths had in fact been premeditated was going to be easier said than done. Because of the marriage of the Sid, of Sid Hatfield to Mayor Tessman's wife shortly after the shootout, the Baldwin Felt Agency attempted to push a theory that staged the incident to kill Tesserman and to take his wife. Their evidence was the testimony of C.E. Lively, a longtime spy for the Baldwin Felts planted in Maitland to incriminate Hatfield and other strikers. But even with his twist, the jury found Hatfield and the accused not guilty. Spring of 1921 brought high promises to the strike. Sid Hatfield had been elected as the new constable, giving him greater jurisdiction over the legal handlings in the Tug River Valley. The bloodshed had seemingly subsided as the region entered May. Federal troops were pulled, and once more the region was given back to local law enforcement. But as one onlooker would later describe, the West Virginia-Kentucky line was a smoldering volcano with an eruption all the more imminent. Almost immediately, the fight resumed with newfound aggression. On May 12, strikers opened fire all along the Tog River Valley. Guards, police, and company loyal miners from both sides of the valley responded. Machine gun nests came to life, spraying the wooded hills and chasing off snipers, if only temporary. Telephone lines were cut by bullets. Homes and businesses were damaged by stray rounds. Trestles and tipples were dynamited, and people were wounded and killed, regardless of allegiance. Captain Brokus raced with a small team of troopers from town to town, vainly attempting to stop the firefights. Finally, on the third day of hostilities, Brokus managed to gain the help of a Kentucky physician to reach the strikers and ask for a ceasefire. When word reached Charleston of what became known as the Free Day Battle, the newly elected Governor Ephraim Morgan was panic-stricken. Unaccustomed to handling violence in the coal fields, Morgan immediately called for harshest forms of action. He began repeatedly telegraphing the White House, pleading that nothing short of 100% martial law could restore order. 
Receiving nothing but silence, Morgan turned back to his state police. Again, the commander refused to enter the Tug River Valley. Frustrated, Morgan looked for an alternative. He found it in the form of Major Thomas B. Davis. Davis was a military man who had thrived in putting down domestic unrest. He was sent into Mingo County with orders to take charge of the state police, as well as a small vigilance committee that had been formed from the so-called better citizens of the Tug. His arrival in Williamson was in conjunction with Governor Morgan enacting state emergency laws on May 19th, on the one-year anniversary of the May 1 massacre, putting the entire region under martial law. Freedom of speech and peaceful assembly were suspended. Davis, with the help of Captain Brokus, went about apprehending strikers left and right. Keeney attempted to protest these tactics, but his pleas fell on deaf ear. Davis reveled in the power he had been handed, telling one reporter, The big advantage of this martial law is that if there's any agitator around, you can just stick him in jail and keep him there. After mopping through agitators off the streets, Davis began theorizing the best way to put down future violence was by taking control of the camps of strikers. He wished to expel these families from the Union camps and put them into new ones under the watchful eye of police. Its newfound agenda of his of this may have been what led to the events of June 21st. When word of strikers at a tent calling near Williamson had fired upon a passing car, Captain Brokus and Davis gathered a armed posse to investigate. When a reportedly unarmed striker guarding the camp requested him to halt, he was shot and killed. The posse poured into the camp, tearing up the canvas. Armed strikers engaged in a firefight at the rear of the camp. This attack on the Lick Creek Colony backfired on Davis, as sensationalized reports of women and children being shot at reached newspapers and caught the attention of Capitol Hill. Senator Hiram Johnson of California pushed for an investigation into the Mingo strike. The U.S. Senate officially passed the resolution and called for key figures to speak. Over the span of eight days at July, the Rogues Gallery of the strike passed through the Capitol building. The biggest name being Sid Hatfield, who had now achieved celebrity status thanks in part to the UMWA's advertisement campaigns. But even with the testimony of Hatfield and others, the Senate were moved, were moved to do little and push forward in intervention with the strike. Hatfield returned with word he and Deputy Ed Chambers would be in charge with the involvement of a tipple explosion in McDowell County, charges that were questioned and worrisome to Keeney. Hatfield and Chambers went to the county seat of Welch on August 1st for the trial. Joined by their wives, they walked passively up the stairs leading into the McDell County Courthouse. At the top of the landing stood C.E. Lively and a small contingent of Baldwin Felts. Lively brandished two pistols. In seconds, Hatfield and Chambers were slain on the steps. <laughs>